Hey, Salvador Brigman here. Welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified YouTube channel. And today we're talking about the difference between e-commerce and brick and mortar stores and some of my own thoughts and observations and kind of what goes into that. And just kind of giving my own angle um, in the way that I like to explain things and the way that I kind of just dial down and get in when it comes to demystifying this process for you. So that's what we'll talk about today. We're getting into it in just a second. Okay, so what are some of the differences between e-commerce and brick and mortar stores? And also like, which one is the best fit for you, right? So obviously I can't speak in general to everyone that's out there, but I kind of want to just like, like start the discussion and begin to give people ideas. So if you have any thoughts on this subject, we'd love to hear from you in the comment section down below. Also give me a thumbs up if you do like the videos that I put out and also some of the other stuff that I got out there. We talk a lot obviously about Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and e-commerce on the channel, but I also want to balance that out with some little different ways that um, the brick and mortar stores are just different. So let's get into some of the pros and cons. Well, first of all, I want to talk about a subject, which is marketing, right? So I think this is really important because the way in which people experience products are different. Um, the way in which you're going to consider buying a product is going to be different in person versus online, right? And that's going to really inform a lot of the ROI of different marketing advertising you're doing. But also, it's important for you to know as a creator of the product how people are consuming it, right? So first of all, when it comes to brick and mortar stores, I first want you to think about how you find out about products that you consider buying. For a lot of people out there, it might be from television, it might be seeing their brand somewhere online sometimes, um, it might be that you're sort of walking through the store, right, and they happen to notice a product, or they're going for a particular aisle, like they're looking to um, go into CVS and maybe get some kind of shampoo, right, or get something that's a man's um, scent or like cologne or something like that, and they go to that section in CVS or in whatever pharmacy, Walgreens, whatever, they go there and then they discover a couple other products that are there. So there are a lot of different ways that this happens. In general, also, I mean, people will still look through catalogs, they'll look at coupons, and maybe they discover about new products that way and they consider buying them, and then go in store in order to purchase it, right? So there's a certain degree of demand, which is influenced by marketing. If you see something on Shark Tank, you might go into the as seen on TV products when you're going into a particular store. However, you might also be like me, you go into Dick's Sporting Goods, right? and you're thinking about maybe learning how to box and you're going there and just looking at different equipment and boxing stuff, end up seeing something else, you're like, oh, I want that thing, right? So there's a lot more of what I call serendipity when it comes to um, more brick and mortar stores where people are just shopping in general. They don't always know what they're going to buy. So I think that as a comparison, it makes a lot of sense to compare more of something like a Dick Sporting Good, um, Walmart, you know, something where there's a lot of different types and brand names of products, Walgreens, retail, right? It's good to compare that more with Amazon because Amazon is kind of similar. We have a lot of different types of products, a lot of different categories, a lot of different brand names, okay? When it comes to Shopify, Shopify is more of like what I would consider like a mom and pop operation or someone who um, is just so passionate about having their own stores and they develop their own products, right? Um, so I think one would be like, um, you know, Apple, great example, right? They have their own in-person stores and they obviously do carry some other brands as well, but they try to keep it within their own ecosystem, at least when they're first getting started, right? So you want to kind of make that comparison. That's more Shopify, Amazon is a little bit more when it comes to like Walmart or um, those bigger stores that have lots of different brand products. So I'm kind of just quickly talk about that. I want to talk a little bit about the impression. So like when someone's going into a store, right? Let's just assume that they don't know necessarily what they want to buy, okay? They're going into the store, they're just kind of in like more of a buying mood, they're just kind of browsing around, right? How are you going to get that person's attention? How are you going to get them to buy a product? Well, it almost always has to do with either some kind of a display or within the actual store section, you kind of scream out to someone with either your packaging, the way your bottle looks, if it's like shampoo, for example, or the colors or the fonts, it gives a certain vibe. Like if you think of like the Axe brand, you know, Axe when it comes to like that body spray or they now they have shampoos and like all those kinds of things, very black kind of looking. That's a very distinct brand that's meant for young men, right? And you have other types of products, more like a Dove, right? Dove has a very different type of branding and even commercials and feeling when you look at their products, right? The, the shape, the colors, the fonts that they're using, they're appealing to different customers. So a lot of the marketing within brick and mortar stores has to do with, is this product screaming out to me, 
right, when it's on the shelf. Is this thing capturing my attention? Is this getting my eyes to go and look at this? And if I am considering buying something just in a general category, am I gonna be comparing two things and like, hmm, this one says that this shampoo, or that this, let's say this toothpaste has teeth whitening, and this one doesn't. Oh, I want teeth whitening, right? So I'm gonna go after that one. It's also calling out to a certain type of customer. So you kind of almost wanna think of it as the packaging, the look and the feel, the branding of the actual product is more in line with an advertisement, right? Because if you think about running a Facebook ad or digital marketing ads with e-commerce, you are trying to do the same thing. You're trying to scream out to someone, right? Who's looking and scrolling on their phone and like you're trying to get them to stop a scroll stopping ad and to consider purchasing it, right? And then maybe it isn't the same comparison unless it's like Amazon, but it's in the same way you're trying to scream out to someone. So brick and mortar, Naturally, as a creator, you have a little bit less control over the environment in which you are selling this. Um, because you, maybe you have the ability or have the rights to have a stand with your product, or maybe you don't. Maybe there are certain criteria when it comes to what you're allowed to include on in the labels or the packaging or the way that the thing looks, right? And, or the size and how it has to fit on the shelf. Um, so there are different requirements there. But what you should take away is that so much of your success is gonna obviously come from some of the marketing you're doing outside of the store, but also within the store. How you're capitalizing on the foot traffic, how you're screaming out to someone, how you're comparing, the look and the feel of the product. Those different things are gonna matter so much more when it's in person, because also a lot of these are just very impromptu decisions when it comes to that. Now, when we're comparing that to more e-commerce, it's a little bit different, right? Because you do can see, you know, on Shopify or on Amazon, you can see a photo of the product. You can kind of get a sense of how it looks and you might even scroll down and there's then more potential on the Amazon page or the Shopify store to be able to experience the brand and how it feels and some of the stuff that they're trying to draw your attention towards. But it's a little bit different, if you know what I'm saying. Your virtual behavior is different online than it is in person. Because let's be honest, in person, like, you are having a lot of things with your mind, but you're always in one place. Online, you can have like thousands of browser windows open, tons of stuff commanding your attention. And there's, there's always these different things that are trying to capture that attention, which I think is one of the most important currencies. So when it comes to marketing online, a lot of it is how people discover the product, how they've been pre-framed before they've gotten there, and the analytics that you're running behind the scenes, but also obviously the conversion on that actual page. So one of the, the big differences here is like, with stores, you can obviously see sales volume, right? You can see the number of products that are flying off the shelf, right? And that's really, at the end of the day, what makes a best-selling a really interesting product or what the retailer to order more of them, right? When it comes to the online world, you have a lot more data and analytics typically as the creator of a product. So you can also incorporate that into your marketing decisions. So you, it's really hard to track if you're doing like an advertisement or a TV ad, the ROI of that actual experiment. Now you can maybe forecast or you can get some fancy consultants involved and maybe have a sense there, but it's gonna be a little bit different, right? Also when it comes to marketing, you might have word of mouth marketing, right? That's happening in a brick and mortar store or in person where people are telling you, you gotta check this thing out. You gotta try this new cookie cutter, right? Or you gotta try this new um, device that I love that just purifies the air in my house or this other thing, this air um, fermenter or um, like this perfume, right? You gotta try out this thing. Um, and that happens in person. That happens one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting. And there's no real easy way to track that, right? However, online, you can also measure that same thing when it comes to comments, social shares, people that are mentioning your product around the globe, even just seeing news articles that are coming out or uh, people that are talking about it on Reddit and other social bookmarking sites. So it's almost as though the internet is written in pen, right? Whereas in person, it's not really as easy to really read clearly what is happening until you really get the numbers into play. And for that reason, it can be a little bit slower, I find than um, a little bit more of like a dinosaur medium, but still also is incredible. You know, it's just a little bit different in the way that marketing is tracked. The other comparison point that I would like to make aside from marketing is barriers to entry, right? So barriers to entry is just a fancy word for like how, how, heck, how, how easy is it for you to get your product out there for people to check out and to consider buying. Now barriers to entry could be fitting your product into a retail store environment, right? In which case, you're gonna to need to convince 
that person or that chain of stores or you know whatever the type of you know environment it is that it's worthy for them to consider taking a chance on having your product right you're gonna have to demonstrate that in some way same thing goes I mean if you're opening your own stock or your own store of some kind in a local town then there's just the onus on you to have rent to have the brick and mortar establishment to have staff it right so there tends to be a little bit of a bigger barrier to entry um, if you already are seeing like crazy demand for your product or you already have a really incredible thing that solves a really big problem, then it might not matter as much, right? Um, but if you're still in the early stages, it might be a little more difficult for you to convince some of these larger stores to even consider you. In the same way that like, for example, if in Barnes & Noble, it might be hard for an author to convince them to have their book. I would compare it almost to um, traditional publishing to independent publishing, right? Really easy for anyone to publish a book when it comes to independent publishing. A little bit more difficult when it comes to getting into a major store like Barnes & Noble or getting on one of those lists, right? So with e-commerce, the barriers to entry tend to be super low. But at the same time, that also means you got a lot of competition. So you have a lot of people out there who don't even necessarily own their own products, so they're trying to compete with you when it comes to e-commerce. So people that are trying to, you know, do drop shipping or just trying to sell and resell products, right? Or those kinds of things, white labeling. Um, you have a lot of competition as well that can make it more difficult if you don't know what you're doing on the marketing side. On the flip side, a lot of those people also tend to be really temporary when it comes to a marketplace and they quickly learn that it's not as much of a sustainable model. And if you're gonna do it, you might as well do it right and just create your own product and your own brand from scratch in that way and solve a real problem. So barriers to entry, just to recap, I'd say a lot lower on the e-commerce side, usually a little bit higher you know, when it comes to the brick and mortar side. Next component has to do with sales, right? So there are a lot of different types of deals that you may, might make when it comes to a retail outlet. So there's a lot of variety there. I'm not gonna try and cover them all, right? But um, I would say when it comes to having your own e-commerce store, it's really about you and the type of inventory that you want, right? So inventory is gonna obviously depend on your manufacturer and your minimum order quantities and all that kind of stuff. But also you want to think about like, do I want to have extra inventory so that when I sell out, I can continue selling until I get the next inventory order. If I'm doing something like a Kickstarter campaign, what is going to be my minimum order quantity? I'm going to get double that maybe if I'm going to sell on Kickstarter and then also sell with a Shopify store or with Amazon, right? So there are all so many different requirements there that you might have as a particular creator, but you do have a lot more control over it. Now, obviously you have to have a fully stock store if you're doing stuff like Amazon, you don't want to sell out, right? You want to make sure that you're always um, increasing your inventory and these kinds of things. But at the end of the day, it's not the worst. You know, it's not going to be a nightmare. And, and also when it comes to that, it gives you a lot more say over how quickly you want to sell if you're doing your own store, for example, on Shopify. So you could have the product go through periods of being available or not available. And that's honestly your decision. You might be missing out on some sales and some money, and you might have some angry customers who want to find out when the thing comes out, but really it's your decision. When you begin to get more into retail, it's almost like you're working more with partners. And when you're working with partners, partners have different sets of expectations different business models than you. So they need to make money, you need to make money, and you have to always be aware of what their requirements are going to be when it comes to that or when it comes to different inventory requirements. So it's just a little bit of a different animal in that way. And now every store is gonna be different when it comes to a brick and mortar store, or you know every single you know retail might be different and the deal that you make there specifically, but there are gonna be some differences, noticeable differences, I say, when it comes to thinking about inventory, supply chain, logistics, um, and, and how you're going to have to compensate for that between the two. The next thing I want to talk about is scalability, right? Because I think this is actually um, one of the main reasons that people want to go the more traditional route is because you can kind of just push a button, right? And all of a sudden your product is appearing in many different stores around the world versus if you have more just an e-commerce store, it's kind of limited to the people that can come to that or when it comes to Amazon, people that are searching for that or the number of people that are on their site. And I think that's a really legitimate argument. Um, the, the problem I think with it is just deciding what it is that you care most about as a creator, as an entrepreneur, or as an individual. And are you prizing more control? Do you want distribution? Do you want scalability? What are you trying to do? What kind of company are you trying to create, 
right? So are you trying to create a company that is mainly solo and based online and you're trying to have that kind of a lifestyle and kind of have a smaller company and be able to put money into your ads from the profit and that kind of stuff and grow it organically? Are you trying to maybe get outside investors involved who will help you even with a retail play and get you in many different stores and have lots of scalability, lots of sales, right? Lots of order volume and managing that supply chain to be able to also to fill that. It's up to you. Um, but I think that's one big noticeable difference when it comes to that. I think that's something that a lot of creators also have recognized when it comes to that. So scalability is another component that you should consider when you're comparing e-commerce with uh, more of a brick and mortar store. The next to me sounds obviously super basic and I think it might seem basic to you if you're familiar at all, but it just has to do with location and or virtual real estate, right? So when you have a brick and mortar store, you're confined to that physical location and your sales are gonna be really dependent on the foot traffic to that location. So it depends on like, you know, if you're talking one store, you're talking a couple or how that's gonna work, but it's something to be mindful of that if your sales are dependent on foot traffic, then you also are dependent on people being willing to go into the store. So obviously that can have effects, for example, you have like a major pandemic like COVID and you see e-commerce shooting up and less and less people buying in person in store. Or how does that affect it in different times of the year and, and these different components? So location does matter and it's something that is hyper important when it comes to brick and mortar stores. When you're online and doing e-commerce, it's a little bit less important. However, the thing that will matter more is your virtual real estate, right? So you could, for example, be a Canadian company and you're selling e-commerce products in the United States and your location might matter when it comes to things like your local business taxes and laws and that kind of stuff. And it might also matter when it comes to your talent pool, who you're hiring. It also might matter when it comes to the logistical side of fulfillment, right? Go and check out Fulfill right as well. You know, if you want to make sure that your location is not tied to where you are necessarily, the sponsor of my YouTube channel. But that being said, you could have a supply chain that is independent of where your actual location or headquarters is obviously as a store owner, right? When it comes to e-commerce. Um, so that's something to also think about, but I would say when it comes to comparing location, the biggest thing is like the virtual real estate that you have. And by virtual real estate, I mean like um, the amount of attention that you have on social media pages, the foot traffic, AKA the visitors that are going to your website, where they're discovering that from. Are they typing in your brand name into Google? Are they stumbling upon it from seeing an Instagram, TikTok, or uh, a Facebook or a YouTube ad, right? How are they discovering you? Your foot traffic, you know, it doesn't exist in the virtual world, but what exists are visitor and visitor flow and optimizing for conversions on that actual store. So that's also, I'd say a major difference is location and it's a variable you have to consider. I think it's also important to point out, you know, coming with location is the business model itself, right? So let's just talk about like brick and mortar. Um, you could be running your own store. Okay, so what's gonna be impacting your business model? Obviously it's gonna be real estate, is going to be things like the inputs that go into running that. So for example, staff, um, any kind of you know taxes and things that are related to that. So there's certain ones if you're running your own brick and mortar store. Um, when it comes to like you know retail and that kind of stuff, there are obviously some different costs that are you have to take into account there when it comes to what your product price is, what you're selling to them for, what they're selling it for, right? There are some different things to think about there. Um, when it comes to e-commerce, if you are controlling a lot of the experience and you're doing like a Shopify or you're doing your own website, um, a lot of your expenses are gonna be related to marketing, they're gonna be related to software cost, apps, um, that kind of stuff, and maybe a couple of staff to really host this, but it's a little bit um, different in that way versus if you had an in-person store, you're gonna have higher levels of fixed costs typically in order to just have the opportunity to get in front of the customer and to sell them in that environment. Want to take all the stress out of fulfilling your Kickstarter rewards? Fulfillright is the turnkey solution that puts product delivery on autopilot. The top campaigns use this trusted high-tech provider to store, package, and ship their products. Focus on growing your business. Leave shipping to the experts. Don't wait. Get a custom quote from Fulfillright today. Link in the description. So there's a lot that um, I think we can talk about. So I'm going to cover just like two more, and then I'm going to talk about like some things that I think are the future when it comes to this. 
So the first one would be thinking a little bit about customer service, right? So customer service is a major part of any kind of product um, company. So customer service for a lot of people, if you're doing your own store, is going to be obviously face to face and also dealing with those different kinds of customer inquiries if there are returns and those kinds of things. If you're in a different environment, like a retail environment, then it might be having those people um, handle that. And you know that's more of the burden of the person who's running this larger store environment, right? And um, you might have to then consider that when it comes to you know returns, etc. When it comes to more online, you could have a very distributed team. So you could have people that are you know not even necessarily in the same country as you. And I guess you could technically do that as well um, if people are like calling up the phone, right? When it comes to another store or like the, the manufacturer, etc. Like that that can make sense there. But typically, when it comes to a virtual e-commerce store, you're going to be doing a lot of the customer service, particularly with a Shopify, right? You're going to have some kind of a website that people can go to and maybe having a ticket ticketing system of some kind. Um, that can be pros and cons, right? So having a ticketing system and staffing the store is something to be aware of, um, but it also can make sure that people can have ready access in that way and you don't always necessarily have to set up like a phone line or something like that in order to offer customer service. So this is just another variable. Another variable on top of that, I would say, just even before that would be like transactions and how transactions happen, you know, because if you're doing this brick and mortar store, you might have to set up your own cash register or use something like Square or different apps that are out there in order to accept payments. Or you might be even just accepting cash payments. Like it, it depends obviously on your unique situation. Online, it's obviously gonna be exclusively online payments. You have to have a good uh, payment processor and be aware of the different fees that are being charged there. And if you're collecting everything that you need to when it comes to sales tax, where is the buyer located, right? If you're more of just in one area, Buyers are going to be located in that area. If you're doing e-commerce, they might be located around the world, right? So there are different variables to consider when it comes to the transaction and also when it, can, uh, when it comes to the actual customer service there. So the last thing I want to talk about is just kind of where life is going. Um, but before I do, I just want to say like the whole point of this video is just to get you thinking and to get you um, considering some of these differences and some of the variables that you're going to have to take into account. Um, so now that you're beginning to think, I want you to really consider what is the best for you, what you're trying to accomplish as a creator, what is going to be the best fit for you going forward? What is going to allow you to have the most leverage in the future? What is going to allow you to grow your potential the most? You know, do you want to have a massive company? Do you want to have a small, very profitable company? Um, what do you want to be doing? I would love to hear you hear from you in the comments down below. What are you trying to achieve? And to really just like commit to that if you want to. Um, so the, the other thing I want to talk about is like where are things going from here? So in so in terms of you know my own thoughts, um, I don't think we're ever going to see like the death of brick and mortar stores, but I do think that we're definitely seeing a shift in the way that consumers are making buying decisions. So we're always going to have brick and mortar stores, we're always gonna have people going into stores and buying things and maybe technology increases and there are more technological revolutions that are incorporated into actual buying and purchasing. So I think of like the movie Minority Report. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. It's a really good movie if you go check it out. It's a little bit strange, but it's also kind of, kind of good uh, with Tom Cruise. But Minority Report will give you like an idea of like what well, could be your super futuristic store environment where you can even uh, be greeted like personally and you can have all this different information when you're making purchases in the store. I could see something like that happening in the long term future. I would say in the near future, we're seeing a massive shift, my friend, from brick and mortar stores to actually online purchasing. And you know, this is just across the board. This is around the world that this is happening. And even so, we're even um, seeing more technology that's growing where things like augmented reality allow you to envision a product in your room or near you or on your desk so you don't have to go and see it in the actual physical store environment. So the way that technology is moving right now, it's all moving to online purchasing. It's all moving to you being able to have that same kind of tactile physical experience, but from the comfort of your home using things like augmented reality um, or even things like you know decorating a room and being able to purchase um, interior decorating services and have that room model, right? So you don't necessarily even then have to go into like a physical outlet or like Home Depot to see these different materials. So to me, 
e-commerce is totally the future. And you can see that obviously with the stock prices of things like Amazon and Shopify, et cetera, and all the different companies that are appearing around the world. However, that doesn't mean just because technology is moving that way, that doesn't mean that there still are not massive opportunities on the other side of the coin, on the other side of the equation. Remember, this is about figuring out what's going to be the best fit for you, for your business, for your goals, and for the particular product that you have. And there's no way that I can make a video for every single you know, type of product that's out there. So you should always you know, think about that. And you should always consider what's going to be your future. What do you want to have? Do you want to be using some of these new technology tools that are appearing, um, even things like text message marketing, et cetera? Do you want to be using those things to your advantage in order to scale an online store with a distributed team or people helping you around the world and shipping out products to everyone? Do you want to be in a bunch of different retail stores? Do you want to be able to walk into a store and actually buy your product? Like, What do you want or what is success in your eyes. I really want you to consider that, but I hope you liked this video. At least got you thinking. My name is Salvador Brigman. Give me a thumbs up if you did like this video. Leave a comment down below again if you have any questions, and come subscribe for more videos just like this.